So uh, we've been three weeks on healing, or this is our third week, and today we're going to get into the principles of how do I get my healing? Because a lot of folks um, have a really, ha a, they really struggle with how. They've never been taught. And I want you to know that God didn't leave us in the dark and that he's very clear on how we receive our healing because there, there is a process. I do want to remind you there is a difference between a miracle and a healing. A miracle is an instantaneous work of God that changes the natural by the supernatural that takes really no faith. It can be the faith of the evangelist, the faith of the pastor, the faith of your friend, and all of a sudden God manifests and boom, there's a miracle. You don't even need any faith. But then you have a healing. And let's be honest, most Christians experience healings. When we talked about healing, healing is a progressive uh, manifestation. So it takes longer. Now, when we're talking about taking longer, what does that mean? Well, that could be three minutes. That could be five minutes. That could be a, a week. That could be five years. It could be 10 years. That, we don't know the timetable, but we do know that if you're going to receive your healing and if you're going to keep your healing, then you have certain principles of faith that are mandatory. Faith is a mandatory. Amen. Amen. We walk by faith and not by... So faith is a mandatory. If you get a miracle, you don't need faith to get your miracle. But you need faith to keep your miracle. So whether or not it's faith to get or faith to keep, you still need faith. What is faith? Faith is calling those things which are not as though they already are. Faith is saying that if God said it, I believe it, even if I can't see it, touch it, feel it, smell it, sniff it. Smell, sniff, same thing. So faith is powerful because faith says I've already gotten it before I can see it in my hands. Most people believe in Christendom, they believe faith is I believe it, well, I'll believe it when I see it. That's not faith. How many of you saw Jesus Christ appear to you the day you were born again? I've, I've known many. Has anybody in the room? Maybe online. Have you ever seen Jesus? Did you ever see Jesus appear to you? I need to refresh this. Ever see Jesus appear to you when you got born again? Anybody online? Not yet? Yes? No? Maybe so? Then how do you know you're saved? Faith. You accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. He did not physically appear to you. But by faith you received it, and the Bible says that his spirit bear, bears witness with your spirit that you are one with God. So there is a supernatural transformation that occurs when you're born again because you receive Christ by faith. If you had to wait for Jesus to show up to touch you on the shoulder to be born again, you might not be born again. Now, there are many that have had that experience, and it has been powerful, and it has been life-transforming. But most people, when they are born again, do not have a physical manifestation of Christ standing in front of them, leading them to salvation. It is by faith through grace or grace through faith that we are saved. You know, you have to have faith. Faith is not, I believe it when I see it, if that's true, then that means you have to wait to see Jesus physically before you can be saved. But that's not faith. Faith is... I believe it, I receive it, and then, bam, the manifestation begins. Anything more to add? Well, it's just, it's just like when you're on an airplane, right? We don't see, we don't understand how it's held up, but, boy, we sure like to travel and get on that plane. And that takes faith. And it's, you know, it's, uh, you know it seems like we so easily um, have faith in things uh, created things, man-made things. We don't have a problem second-guessing that. We really don't. It's just by faith, just like as easy as getting on an airplane. But we have so much trouble believing for healing, having faith for healing. And that, to me, just really stumps me all the time because faith is faith. Where are you putting it? Listen, if you have faith for a nickel, you have fi faith for a million. Amen. Faith is faith. Faith is trust God. 
that if God said it, I believe it. You know, when you do get on the airplane, how many of you usually uh, won't go in the air until you personally meet uh, the pilot and get their flying license? We should go, probably. <laughs> Has anybody ever done that? No. No. You've met the pilot, but you didn't go up and say, listen, man, I don't really know you, so can you please, I need to see your, your pilot's license. Right. How many years, you, you know, you'd go through an interview. How many years you've been flying? You know, how many crashes have you had? You know, you know, when was the last time you drank? You know, you know, you haven't done any of that stuff with the pilot, but you get on a bus and they take you 30,000 feet in the air and you trust them. And you have to trust even those who built the plane. We don't meet them. It's like, how do we know they built it properly to keep us in the air? But we never question that. Well, we I, I do. I kind of think about it, but it yeah, freaks me out, so I stop thinking about it. I just get on the plane, I pray. Right, but even the inspector. We've never met the inspector. Right. Right. Tell them about the time you were on the plane and it was a hard, uh, and you grabbed the guy next to you. Oh, my goodness. So I'm on a plane. I'm by myself, and it's going, and it's going great. And then it drops about 300 feet in a matter of seconds. Just drop. And my heart stayed in my mouth. And I got really, 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 like, scared. I just have to admit, I got scared. I'm thinking, I'm going to die, right? And uh, so I grabbed the hand of the guy next to me. And he just looked at me. And I said, I'm so sorry. He's like, it, it, it's okay. It's really okay. So I did, he just hold my hand. It's fine. And so it just brought me comfort, which was kind of stupid, whatnot. But, um, but we do because at that point, we grasped because I had no faith in the plane anymore. So I needed something tangible to hold on to. And we are creatures of the tangible. Like, if we don't see it, we don't believe it. And so we're creatures of tangible. And God is a spirit. And we can't see him. Jesus, we don't see him. He died 2,000 years ago. But we do have faith for salvation. So again, the question, why don't we have faith for healing? It really is that simple. We make it so hard. We really do. You get in a car and you came to church tonight. You know, honestly, how do you know the person's going to stay in their lane? You don't. You don't. It's just straight faith. You know, but we apply that faith there, but we have a struggle. We, we really have a hard time believing God who hasn't lied. We have a hard time believing God who hasn't lied, but yet we'll believe man and believe man's creations, um, even though that takes more blind faith. You know, it's amazing when you really think about it. Boy, that, that magnet is pretty strong. Uh, um, I remember one time I did an interview of a local pastor for our TV program. And we did it right here on the altar, actually. And afterwards, um, he wanted to go for lunch. Well, he brought his vehicle. I brought my vehicle. And he said, why don't you ride with me? Well, he was like 85 or 86. Nothing wrong with 85 or 86. But I said to myself, I, I didn't hear you. I said to myself, uh, don't ride with him. Okay. He doesn't so, need to be 85. You won't ride with me either if I drive. That is a fact. He gets sick when I drive. Really? <laughs> that's not faith. That's just passenger nausea. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. I'm a very good driver. He just doesn't like sit in the passenger seat. So he said to me, he said, why don't you ride with me? I said, no. And I'm watching him leave the church driveway, and he's driving down the wrong side of the road, down Old Ithaca Road, and he got down past the brewery, he tried, finally figured out he's on the wrong side of the road, and I'm saying, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> so we put our faith in a lot of things on a consistent day. You know, when you get up in the morning and you grab your cell phone, you put your faith that, that the time changed in the air before you woke up. So, Pastor, I'm going to interrupt you. So, does that mean that trust and faith go together? Oh, yeah, they're synonymous. So, you got to trust the pilot to get on the plane. You got to trust the engineers to get on the plane. So, there's a matter of trust. So, if we don't trust God and His Word, maybe that's where some of us can't trust really having faith in healing. Well, that's the point, trust. is that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Most churches are not teaching it is always God's will to heal. Most churches teach that. It's the lucky wheel. You know, if you get, if you, if it lands on you, shazam, it's your turn. They don't always teach it is always God's will. But we've already gone through. You cannot separate the blood and the, 
The blood represents? The body represents? All the way through Scripture. Come on now. Exodus 12, Exodus 15, Psalms 103, Psalms 105, Psalms 107, Isaiah chapter 53. Yep, there we go. 53, uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse 17, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. All say the same thing. Blood and body, blood and body, blood and body, blood and body. You can't separate it. So the issue really isn't, for faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Many churches, because they're not teaching the principle that when it comes time, everyone's philosophy is, well, if I die, then I'm healed. No, you didn't get healed if you died. You died. You don't need healing in heaven. So, you know, this is a, a good Christian uh, cop-out, we'll call it. And you've got to be able to look at faith and say, if God said it, then he said it. Now, there are times that people pass. We're standing right here. Uh, I'm, she's sitting. I'm standing. And both of our spouses died. I don't understand it all. I know Rhonda, and we talked about some of the scenarios last week. She talked about her husband and uh, how he was ready to go home days before. He said, I'm ready to go home. And Rhonda was the same principle. Got tired, ready to go home. Just didn't want to keep fighting. That's life. You can't change that. But the fact is, is that just because somebody didn't produce what you thought they were going to produce doesn't mean God's a liar. Man is liars. God cannot lie. If God lies, God can't be God. Turn real quick to Hebrews chapter 6. That's in the last book of the Old Testament. See, every man's a liar. Amen. Yes, Eileen, you do need to think about flying next time. <laughs> here it is right here. Isaiah chapter, I mean, excuse me, Matt, uh, Hebrews chapter 6. 8, 6. No. Hebrews 8, 6? No, That's what 6. Here. Oh. I'm not there. I'm not even in that portion. Here it goes. Verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could, uh, could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, sure, uh, surely, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. So remember, he was told he was going to have a son. It was 20 years after uh, he was told he was going to have a son that God opened the womb of his wife. So the Bible says he waited patiently for his promise. Now, uh, then we go on. For men indeed swear by, ga by greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end to all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed by an oath. So what that means is God gave us a promise, and then he gave us an oath that he cannot lie. So if God made this part of his covenant, God can't lie. Well, it actually says that here in the next portion. That by two immutable things, the promise and the oath. Remember what an oath was given for. A promise should be good enough. But when an oath was given, it was about life or death. If you broke an oath, it cost you your life. You died. I mean, it's not like today. You know, you just skip out on your promises. No big deal. But in those days, you gave an oath, you're dead. They didn't even think a thing about it. That was death sentence. Break your oath, you die. And so here we are, we're looking at God saying, here, there's two immutable facts, two undeniable facts. By my promise and an oath, and then it goes on to say right here, mm, there we go. That by, verse 18, by two, these two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. It is impossible for God to lie. So you and I have to come to a place in our life of saying, do I believe God? Do I want to believe God or do I want to believe in experience? A lot of people put more faith in their experience than they do in the God of his word. I'll give you an example. I had an uncle who I loved dearly, a great man of God. And um, he uh, actually came down with rectal cancer. And so I was preaching up there, and 
I had preached up there one year, and uh, he had had it, and he was standing in faith. And the next year, I went back up, and um, he he was he was definitely getting worse. And so, um, about two o'clock in the morning, he t- asked Rhonda and I and his wife. We were talking, but let's go out to the kitchen table. Went out to the kitchen table, and he looked at us, and he said, I'll tell you why I'm not healed. No one ever have known. My wife put me through hell when she went through menopause. She went completely out of her mind, and I just cannot forgive her for that. He told us, out of his own mouth, why he was not healed of rectal, rectal cancer. And he died of rectal cancer. Even though when he died, it was a miracle, he never took even aspirin. His rectum, they said, was about this large, all eaten out. And he never, he never, took, never took Tylenol, nothing. The doctor said he should have been in writhing pain, and he was in very, very little pain or no pain. So even that was a miracle, but the factor of he told us why. See, we assume that Aunt, Aunt, Aunt Betsy didn't get healed, so therefore God wanted to take her. God needed a, another angel. That's lie. God don't need angels. He already made them. He's got all he needs. Amen. He even made some extra. Because he knew some were going to walk away. Amen. Follow Satan. He doesn't need you and I as angels because you're not an angel. The Bible says you're higher than angels. You and I are sons and daughters. He doesn't need his sons and daughters in heaven. He needs his sons and daughters here. Or we wouldn't be having to do this. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers. That's what God tells us to pray. He didn't tell us to pray for souls to be saved. You'll never find that in the New Testament. It's an amazing. Preachers have preached it for years, but you never find that in the New Testament. Where God has said, pray for the sinner to be born again doesn't say that this is what he says pray the lord of the harvest to send forth laborers for the harvest is ready but the laborers are few the more laborers that's why we are pushy here we're pushy for workers here not because we don't have enough to do or too little to do i know the more workers we get the more laborers we get the more souls he'll trust us with so here we are, you know, it's, it's time to recognize that you and I can't base our faith upon somebody else's experience, on somebody else's faith level. You've got to, you've got to look at the word of God. You've got to say, what does God say about this? And you've got to believe God. God's word is above your experience. Just need to say that again. God's word is above your experiences. God's word is above your experiences. Amen. Amen. And until you grasp that, then you're always going to be basing your faith level on somebody else's experience or your understanding. The Bible says there's a way that seems right unto man that leads to death. So you cannot have faith and still go to heaven, but not get what you need physically. You got to recognize that we play a part in receiving from the Lord. Faith is a part of, it is that connector It is that portion, our part, of receiving by faith. So we must believe that Jesus did it for you. You know, everyone has, no one has a problem believing for somebody else, but they have a problem when it's them. That's the key. You have to believe this is for you. We've already gone through Matthew chapter 8, verse 1 through 2, that dealt, uh, 1 through 3, that dealt with the leper who came to Jesus, he shouldn't have been near Jesus. Remember in those days, if you had a disease or anything that was weeping out of your skin, if you had any kind of uh, bodily fluid manifesting, then you were not allowed to be in public without without screaming, unclean, unclean, unclean. If you did that, if you came into public without screaming unclean, you were stoned to death. 
It was, it was, it was what was happening. So if you had like, if you had a situation to where, uh, like this guy as a leper, you know, he had pus coming out of his face because literally leprosy was eating his flesh alive. And so here he is and he was cast off into the leper's camp. You know, he was outside the camp. He was not allowed to be around normal populace. And here's Jesus. He comes down and he, and he's, he's crying out uh, for Christ to heal him. And he said, Lord, if you will, you can heal me. You can make me clean. And Jesus, watch what Jesus did. Jesus touched him, which was not allowed. Touched him and said, I will. And the man was healed. So that man answered the question of whether it's God's will to heal you. But I can't convince you that it's God's will to heal you. You have to believe it for yourself. You have to believe it's always God's will for you not to be sick. Well, I've seen some really good things come out, come out of people being sick. God makes all things work together for good to those that are in Christ Jesus. It doesn't mean that the things are good. You know, God can turn the bad to positive. You know, even the, the catastrophe that we've had, God's going to turn that to positive. You know, we're writing the books. We're going to get out there. We're going to help people heal. Why? Because that's God's will. Was it God's will that Aldo died? No, he was young. Was it God's will that Rhonda died? Absolutely not. But can God make a great scrambled egg? Amen. So you must believe. Go ahead. So I think of the story of uh, the blind Bartimaeus, where he was blind, but he heard what Jesus was doing. He heard about Jesus, and I believe he, he knew who Jesus was because he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. But the thing is, he had friends around him, people around him that said, you know, keep your mouth shut. Don't, you know, don't bother the master. You know, you're just a blind beggar. Why, you know, why are you bothering the master? And he said even more. It says, he said even louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He knew that if he would go to Jesus, that Jesus could heal him. And I love that he took his cloak off as a sign of faith. Before I even get there, I know that I'm going to take off my old tunic, which represented that I'm a blind beggar, and he is going to make me new. And so he ignored the naysayers. He ignored them. You have to ignore the naysayers. And Jesus stopped, and he says, okay, bring him to me. And then all of a sudden, there are his friends, you know, oh, the master wants him, right? But he, he goes to the master, and Jesus asks him a loaded question. He says, what do you want me to do for you? Mm. Wow. Now, if the master asked me, if Jesus asked me that, I'm like, well, do you have a few hours, a few days? <laughs> Seriously. But Bartimaeus went by faith, took off his beggar clothes, went to him expecting to be healed. Because as soon as Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? He knew the answer. He says, Rabbi, I want to see. I want to see. That's what I want you to do for me. And his faith and his expectancy, Jesus said, okay. And he healed him. He says, go, you are healed. And it's like, I think that sometimes the naysayers and the voices in our lives, the, the doubts, even from ourselves, will stop us by going to him in faith already before we even get our answer. So we cry out, Jesus, on the day, but you've got to know Jesus. And, and again, it is a trust issue. I believe he trusted that Jesus said who he, Jesus was who he said he was, and he could put his faith in somebody he could trust. I, I challenge you tonight to go home, and I want you to show me one time in Scripture that Jesus turned one sick person away. Show me just one. Show me one time that when Jesus prayed, the Bible says that he didn't heal all. Go look it up. You know, I think this is important. This is important for your faith level to search that out. I mean, I can pop up, a, I can pop up and share every verse with you where Jesus healed all that came to him. And if you look in the book of Acts, they were all healed too. So the issue uh, isn't that God isn't able the issue isn't that God isn't willing. The issue is, will you believe? 
Because what you believe, you receive. If you don't perceive that it's God's will for you to be healed, then you won't be healed. No matter how godly you are. You can have $10 million in a bank account with your name on it, but if you don't believe that that's really yours, you're never going to touch it. Still yours, but you're never going to touch it even though it's yours. And you can die, you can die poor. You can die in ab absolute poverty, but yet have $10 million in the bank. So we've got to believe this. This is about you. It's about you have to believe. It's about you have to believe that God did it for you. And if you don't believe that God did it for you, then you need to start building your faith. Like I said, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You need to study Jesus. You need to study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You need to study the book of Acts. You need to study about how and when Jesus healed. And I want to remind you that in the book of Acts, he said, listen, I, I, there, there are not even enough books to hold all the great things that, and miracles and signs and wonders that Jesus did. What you have in the Bible is concise. He did far more than that. But you have to believe this for yourself. So once you start believing, what do you do? How do I get my healing? Well, there's different ways. There's one way is called uh, calling the elders of the church. You know, it's interesting in today's society. If somebody is sick, they just don't go to church anymore. They disappear. And it's like, no, we got a problem here. Because the Bible's very clear what to do when you're sick. Mm, that's good. Uh, James chapter, if you want to read that, James chapter 5, 14 and 15. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So if you're sick, your job is to call the elders of the church. Yes. I have people that have gone to the hospital. Not too long ago, I had somebody, I found out their kid went and had an operation. Well, I mean, I've been friends with these folks for a lot of years, decades. And I said, why didn't you call? Oh, I didn't want to bother you. Now, I will say this, and I need you to know because of the size church we have, that we do have sick people. And my job is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, bring them to unity, bring them to the maturity, that I've raised up a group of people that will come lay hands on you if you're in the hospital or you're at home, and I might not show up. In fact, I do want to encourage you that if I show up at the hospital with you, you're probably dying. Thanks for the vote of faith. <laughs> I, I will tell you this, Bruce Girardi, Eileen is on, they live in South Carolina now, uh, but Bruce went and had uh, his knees done, and Bruce had worked in one of my ministry, my personal ministry teams for like, I don't know, 10 years at that point in time. So when he was having his knees done, I went to go see him, and he looked at me and he went, you need to leave. <laughs> oh my goodness. So a pastor shows up. You just need to know I'm praying for miracles. Amen. But you get some of one of the other staff members showing up and God moves. Why? Well, because the God said, call the elders of the church. If you're sick, call the elders of the church. Don't go hide. Call the elders. They're going to come. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. That when they release the anointing in your life, that you're going to get healed. There was a woman in our church, she had just newly gotten saved and she had been struggling with cancer for many years and she had gone into somewhat of a comatose state and her husband, who true, true if he was here, he would tell you, um, he, he really wasn't a believer. I mean, he wasn't, he came to church with his wife, but he wasn't born again. And so here, here all of a sudden we get a call, you know, she's in really rough shape. Um, we need, we need you to come out. And they lived out in, the, they lived in the pucker brush, brother. They lived out, out in no man's land. They lived out in the woods. And Pastor Cody and Pastor Chad went and laid hands on this woman. They laid hands on her in the name of Jesus. She sat up, got up, took a shower, and sat down and ate. Her husband was 
mesmerized because God did an absolute miracle. So you need to know that it's not the pastor, it's the elder of the church. And if there's not an elder available, then you yourself can lay hands on yourself, release the anointing, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Praying in faith says this, is that I believe that what God promised, I can receive. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Hebrews 8, 6. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Wow. So if two and a half million people left Egypt yeah. healthy, yeah. Psalms 105, yeah. there was not one feeble among the tribes. Wow. Then what can God do today since Jesus is a mediator of a new and a better covenant with better promises? Wow. The promise is not the, the problem is not. It is not the fact that God can't produce. It's the fact in America, it's not being taught. Mm. You believe what you're taught. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, some of you have, have studied Dr. H Kenneth Hagin before. Some of you have not. Dr. Hagin uh, had, a, had, had serious heart issues as a child and was bedridden and was unable to get out. And he was, had a terminal diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And... He was Baptist. He didn't know. He was taught that God didn't heal everybody. That uh, God stopped that in the first century. That's what he was taught. And he's sitting there dying. And as a kid, he picked up the Bible and he started reading the Bible. And all of a sudden, come on now, the Bible says is the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing of the soul and the spirit and the bone and the marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And that is Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter... 4, verse 12, thank you. I had to find that in my brain. I had to look at it because I was looking at the next verse in John chapter 6. Jesus said, the words that I speak are pneuma and uh, life, zoe life. Amen. So the word is alive. The word is powerful. Mm -hmm. And so he picked up the Bible. And as he picked up the Bible, he started reading on healing and realized it was God's will for him to be healed. And Jesus appeared to him and said, Get your clothes out because at this time, uh, I believe it was the next day, you're going to get up and you're going to be healed. And the next day he got up and he was healed. So it didn't matter what somebody else taught him. He had to find out for himself. Right. Now I want you to know, honestly, uh, I, I went to a, I grew up in a Pentecostal church. I grew up in a mainline Christian denomination. I went to a Pentecostal Bible school, a faith Bible college. But I was never taught that it was always God's will to heal. And I was taught that Kenneth Hagin and Kenneth Copeland were both demon possessed. That they were both false prophets. That was taught that in Bible college. And I'm in my first pastorate. I was in that pastorate for about three years. No one's getting healed. No one's getting filled with the Holy Ghost. And hardly anybody's getting saved. And I said to myself, something's off. And I had a Kenneth Hagin book. I picked it up and I started reading it and realized, my goodness, this is absolutely saturated with scripture. This is, oh, by the way, I then found out that Kenneth Hagin was also in the 1950s ordained in the same denomination I was and believed the same doctrine that I believed. But he was kicked out because they no longer accepted prophets. So here I am. I'm reading this stuff and realizing, wow. I mean, that's powerful. I was not taught this. I did not believe. So I started acting on what I was, what I was reading. People started getting filled with the Holy Ghost. People started getting healed in our church. Started seeing miracles. The power of God started to be released. And it was not because Dr. Hagen is brilliant, but he actually... Sadly enough, taught me more than the Bible school. I had to unlearn some of the Bible school stuff so that I could learn the Bible. <laughs> me too. Mm -hmm. So here we are as Christians. We've got to say, do I believe God's word or not? Because that's the next thing you've got to do. You've got to learn how to receive, and that's with your mouth. Mm -hmm. Life and death are in the power of your tongue. Right. When you receive Jesus, well, we know. 
What does the Bible say about salvation? Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth the Lord, what do you got to do? Confess. confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart, thou shalt be saved. For with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. The, you know how powerful your mouth is? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. So the major part of you and I, as we built our faith, is now we have to verbally proclaim our reception of what Christ has given us. So, Lord, I receive my healing in the name of Jesus. Matthew chapter 21, verse 21 and 22. Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. So it says what? If I say to this mountain. You've got to learn how to speak to your body. Here's one for you. You ready? Jesus never once prayed for a sick person. Never once. Never once. Closest he came to praying for a sick person was at Lazarus' grave. And he went like this. Father, that they may know we are one. And then he said, roll back the stone. And then he said, Lazarus, come forth. He didn't pray, oh God, we beseech thee in the sight of heaven. That thou wouldest come down today and raise Lazarus from the dead. Oh, Jesus. No. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Every single time you see a miracle that Jesus accomplished, he spoke to the situation. He spoke to the sickness. He spoke to the spirits. And he spoke to them and it was accomplished. Your words play a major part in reception and also in, what's the word I'm looking at? Canceling your healing or miracle. Somebody always walks up. What do you need? Well, I've got, well, I've got, I've got diabetes. I said, well, then you can keep it. <laughs> well, what do you mean by that? I said, well, if it's yours, it's yours. But if it's Christ's, it's Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you don't have to be, you, we don't have to be so, so tight with our words. Oh, yes, you do. You have to be tight with your words with your children. You have to be tight with your words at work. You have to be tight with the words with your spouse. Go ahead, say something too stupid to your spouse and see what happens. Oh. <laughs> Not good. You know, and then we just think that. You know, God's word, we can just disagree with God's word. And I want you to recognize something that the very first sin, and, and you know, I, I might get a little backlash at this, but when you look at the sin of Adam and Eve, the sin of Adam and Eve didn't begin by eating the fruit. The sin of Adam and Eve began when Eve opened dialogue with the anti-Bible. When Eve opened a dialogue with the devil, what was the first thing the devil did? This is Genesis chapter 3 for those who want to look it up. He brought into doubt God's word. Did God say? You'll always find doubt and identify doubt by it always questions God's word to be true. Once you see that identification, then you have to take an aggressive posture and you've got to, you've got to guard your mouth. Your tongue is the pen of a ready writer. You've got to guard your mouth. Because whether you like it or not, there are devils just waiting for you to talk. Remember, they only know what you tell them. Satan can't read your mind. He doesn't know your intentions. He only knows what you tell him. I very rarely, if I don't feel good, get up in the morning and go, boy, I feel like crap. No, I don't tell the devil nothing. I'll get up and start praising and start worshiping. The other morning I was vomiting in my mouth, but we won't get into that at all. Moving on. <laughs> now, I want you, I'm just trying to prove something to you. 
that if you say something incorrect, that you are going to be backlash later. I'm going to hear that tonight. <laughs> I'm taking note. You know what? I love what it says in Matthew. It says, whatever things you ask, right? Speak to this mountain, right? Believing you will receive, right? And so you have to confess, believe, and you're saved. So you confess, you believe, and you are healed. You confess, you believe, and you are delivered. And so the word of God that goes forth from his mouth, our mouth from the spirit of God, does not return to him void, but it accomplishes the purpose for which it was sent. Right? So there's authority in the word of God. So Jesus was authority. He is our authority. And I think sometimes we, we are not healed because we don't believe we have the authority to speak to our bodies, to confess things, and then to believe them. I think that we weaken ourselves by not believing the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit within us. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is living in us. Did you ever think about that? The same spirit, I want this to sink in, the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead is living in us. Like we are like powerful beings. Yes. Like we reflect the image of God. We have that same spirit to raise the dead. One of the greatest evangelists, uh, uh, Smith Wigglesworth of our time, the healing evangelist, he just took the authority in Christ and spoke healing over the people. Even he raised 19 people from the dead, all documented. Mm -hmm. It's because he spoke with the authority and he believed in the authority. If, if God's word is supreme authority and we speak it, that authority trumps everything else. So why don't we believe when we speak with authority? I think that that's a missing key uh, to our healing. I really do. Well, I, I absolutely believe you. Mm -hmm. Smith so believed it, three of them were embalmed. Three of the people that he raised from the dead were embalmed. Research that. We Research it. It's documented. Yeah. He actually looked at one of them and said, get up. Yeah. And they didn't. So he picked them up and threw them against the wall. Like many times that he lived. I remember this one woman's testimony. Um, she was, uh, an, uh, she was uh, I believe, a paraplegic or a quad. Uh, para or quad. And uh, they pulled her out of the wheelchair and he said, drop her. And they dropped her. And she went to a pile on the floor. Pick her up. Drop her. <laughs> pile on the floor. About the seventh time, the crowd started getting vicious. And he looked at her and said, you don't like it? It's my meeting. Get out. <laughs> the old timers, they were rough. Pick her up. Drop her. <laughs> Pick her up. Drop her. <laughs> On the tenth time, pick her up, drop her. Boom! She went running around the uh, around the sanctuary because she got mir that miracle. Then her friend saw her walking into her house the next day, came in and got her miracle and got saved too. So it's interesting that if he had if he didn't believe by the, about the fifth time, he would have gone. Well, must be not God's will. Pick her up, drop her. Persistent. Listen, if you if you ever read his stuff, I mean, wow. He took this baby who he took this baby that that uh, I don't know all the details of what was wrong with it, but really messed up child. And he said, put the child on the edge of the stage. And he punted the kid. And when the kid hit the ground, kid hit running. Don't try this at home. No. <laughs> Don't try this at home. Right? What do we do? It's being led by the Spirit as well. But man, he had his faith in his God. Yeah. Amazing. There was another woman, um, and, and this is talked about in one of Dr. Hagen's books, which I thought was just great. And I would strongly encourage you to get Dr. Kenneth Hagen Sr.'s books on healing. They are phenomenal. Um, you can also watch them on YouTube for free. Um, you can also, there's a, just a, a uh, some of the Voice of Healing ministers, you can see some of the old tent revival and the miracles that are there. It helps build your faith. Yeah. But I remember one of them, a woman came up and she had a goiter on her neck to, uh, to her service. They had an evangelist. There's a goiter on her neck. And uh, 
The evangelist walked up and said, in the name of Jesus, and he cursed the goiter. Well, remember, healing is different from a miracle. Everyone expected the goiter to immediately disappear. Well, it didn't. It stayed. She came back the next Sunday, and every Sunday night was testimony night at that church. So she stood up on Sunday night, and she says, I want to thank my Lord for healing me of this goiter. Well, everyone could see the goiter was still there. So people are looking at her. Six months goes by. Sunday night's testimony night, you know. She got up and she says, I want to thank my God for healing me of this goiter. Goiter's still there. Eight months goes by. Testimony night, Sunday night, you know. Anybody got testimony? I do. I want to thank my God for healing me of this goiter. Everybody can see the goiter's still there. So the board decided to step in on this thing, took the pastor in and said, listen, you need to tell her to sit down. We can all see she didn't get her healing. So the pastor obeyed his board. You won't find that happening here. <laughs> I don't have a board that does that to me. And they, she went to it and she said, ma'am, you know as well as I do that that goiter is still there. So we're just asking until it manifests. Just don't, don't give a testimony about it anymore. Well, Sunday night rolled around, you know, testimony night. <laughs> Anybody got a testimony? I do. I want to thank my God for healing me of this goiter. And as they turned to give the death look, it fell off her neck. Wow. Hold on. When was she healed? The first time she was prayed for. You see, everyone wants the manifestation. That's the miracle. But healing says, I receive it. Well, when is it manifesting? Well, does it matter when it manifests? Or does it matter when you believed? That's, good. That's the key. That's good. Faith says, I believe it before I can see it. So if you believe... When somebody lays hands on you, then you're healed the moment that they declare it over your life. And at that moment, that's when you start guarding your mouth. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. Because you're either going to believe or declare God's word, or you're going to agree with your circumstances, which will cancel God's word. You also need to watch out who you hang with. Yeah, the doubters. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, if you knew anything about Pastor Rhonda, when Pastor Rhonda was sick, she stood up on that pulpit, she says, do not ask me how I'm doing. Why? Because how she's doing wasn't the issue. It's what she was believing. They gave her six months to live. She lived almost three years later. So here we are. She wouldn't let anybody. If you spoke negative to her, she'd turn, spin, walk away. She wouldn't be disrespectful to you. Oh, she would. But she wouldn't rebuke you. Well, sometimes she did too. But she would be very clear. I did not, I do not have the luxury of having doubt and unbelief spoken at me. I do not allow anybody to speak doubt and unbelief around my life. Nobody has a right to vomit on me. I've told the story before. I love the story because it's real and my cousin sometimes watches and it's a good reminder of her. I have a cousin named Denise. And I remember way back in Gardner, Massachusetts, 9 Wassa Street, that that's where I grew up in the church, that we would have missionaries come in. And this one missionary dude came in, and he was from Africa. You know, he was a missionary, went to Africa, and he came back with all the big spears, and he came back with the shields. I mean, like all the cool stuff you could stare at and go, that is really neat. And so then he had, uh, come on now, a slideshow. Slideshow, you know, so I'm talking a long time ago. So here he is, he's like, 
eight, seven, eight rows back doing a slide show. And my cousin Denise was sitting behind him. And then I was sitting on uh, over where Grammy Spencer used to sit down on the other side, back more. And all of a sudden, you know, the lights are down and the missionaries. And this is the tribe I've ministered to over here. Yeah, you see, that's where the spear came. And all of a sudden you heard. My cousin Denise puked on the back of the missionary. Down his back. And I'm one of those, like, if you're puking, I'm puking kind of thing. It was not good. It was not a good situation. Now, I, want, I just want you to understand something. I said that for a real re- good reason, so I'm not going to get yelled at, right? <laughs> How many of you said, oh? How many of you went, yes? That, I just, I would love to see that. That is so exciting to me. No. Nah. If you think that is gross, then why would you let anybody puke doubt and unbelief on your faith? Especially if you are a responsive puker. Because if you're allowing them to speak death and death into your life, you're allowing them to speak unbelief into your life, and you're responsive, you're going to now, through your own mouth, cancel the miracle. I'll give you another example. We went out to, to a Kenneth Copeland. We were invited to go to a Kenneth Copeland uh, conference. And so they actually paid for our airplane tickets, paid for our hotel. They wanted to pray for, pray for Rhonda. And so here we are. We get out to that conference, and one of the speakers stands up. I mean, if I said his name, if you are anything close to those channels, then you would know who I'm talking about. Stood up, and he started saying that God doesn't heal any, everybody any longer, and God does this, and God does that. And, my, and, and Rhonda got angry. Like, she didn't, she wasn't sad. She got angry, and she said, I must leave. Now, we were on the second row, and the lady behind us was even more angry. I can, I do not have the luxury to have a man on that altar speak that stuff to my life when I have to have a miracle or I'm going to die. Amen. And she got up and she left and she never went back to another one of his services. But she was angry. You know, we need to get angry when someone speaks against the word of God. When somebody, when you're believing God in faith for a miracle or for a healing, whether it's diabetes, whether you want to grow hair on the top of your head, whether, you know, you, you need, you need a longer toe, whether you need an elbow healed, whether you need lung, uh, I don't care what it is, what, whatever you need, you don't have the luxury to have somebody speak doubt and unbelief to you. You've got to hold firm in faith. And you can't have somebody speak doubt to you. And you've got to be bold enough to say, listen, I love you. You're even a Christian brother. You're even a Christian sister. But I don't, listen, I had a lady. She, her and her husband came to the church. And they were ministers. They were pastors. And she um, was a very sickly woman. Very sickly woman. And um, every, she was just always sick. And so I got her the book, uh, Christ the Healer. And uh, she read the book, started teaching her on healing. And all of a sudden, she got like miraculously healed. I'm talking like she said to me herself, this is the healthiest year of my entire life. And then she's hanging around at a prayer meeting. And one of her Christian friends walked up and says, you know, wow, you seem really, you know, you're doing really good. She goes, I'm believing God healed my body. I've never lived so healthy in my life. It is always God's will to heal me. And she goes, oh, listen, man, that's not true. It's not always God's will to heal you. You know, you've got to realize that, you know, God uses sickness for good in your life. And you've got to just receive that every once in a while. And, and all of a sudden she started listening. Within a week, she came down with hives. The hives went down over her whole body, down her throat, and everything like that. She finally had to come to a place of recanting and re- rejecting what her friend spoke of her life. And then she got healed again, and she'd been healthy again. 
You gotta be careful who's around you. You can't just let everybody speak into your life. Even Jesus, when he went and he healed, I think it was Jairus' daughter. Yep. He got to the house and there were wailers and mourners and complainers. And they were all crying. And he said, get out. Because Jesus and doubt cannot be in the same room. No. You either have Jesus or you got doubt. Even he said, I can't be around this. I cannot do as the Father is telling me to do. I cannot heal with the spirit. It's a spirit of doubt around. He kicked them out. He didn't care who he offended. So I'm with pastor. If there's somebody around you that's saying, you know, really, it's just, you know, this might be God's will for your life. Or maybe you'll get rid of this, you know, in the future. Literally with love, kick him out. And say, I'm not receiving that. I, I've been, you know, I've, I've prayed for things and, and people's like, well, you know what, Lucy, this, this, that. And I'm like, you know what? I don't receive it. I just don't receive your words right now. Amen. And they get offended or hurt, but I have to protect my faith. You must. I have to guard my faith. If faith is the currency of heaven, you don't have to give someone the key to your bank. You don't let someone steal from your bank account. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Fill your life with the word and fill your life with people of faith. So that when your faith is weak, this is the power of a husband and a wife together. When one is weak, the other is strong. You know, when you got faith, I call them faith friends. You got to have faith friends. When you're struggling in your faith, maybe you're, you're uh, going through a difficult time and maybe doubt is trying to sit on you. You need to have somebody who has faith. You can call and say, listen, man, I'm just struggling a little bit. And all of a sudden, they're going to speak life to you. They're going to speak word to you. They're going to speak against the demonic. They're going to speak against the words that do not belong in your life. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And we can be encouraged and strengthened by the people that are around us. We must take a strong spiritual posture. If you're born again, you're not going to let anybody come up and say, well, you're not really born again. Well, you know, you might think you're born again, but you're not really born again. You're going to look at me and say, whatever. Get under the bed. <laughs> Literally, get out. Seriously. Learning Italian. <laughs> so you've got to take a strong spiritual stance. Now, uh, the other thing is you've got to stand firm and you've got to be unmovable in your faith. The greatest deterioration of faith is called time. People struggle with time because we, especially in America, we get it our way when we want it. And you got to recognize that sometimes timing is not our call. Timing is God's call. Faith is our responsibility. God manifests, but it's our faith that we've got to guard and timing doesn't always make sense to us. So um, that is also Jairus' daughter. They, they, Jairus came up to Jesus and said, listen, if you come lay hands on my daughter, I know she'll be well. On the way, Jesus said, I'll go. On the way to Jairus' house, who stopped? The woman with the issue of blood. She, she, she broke in. Now, now, it also says there were a bunch of people thronging Jesus. That means they were close enough to elbow to elbow to touch him. And the woman with the issue of blood snuck in underneath and touched the hem of his garment, and she was healed, which was, again, against the law. So Jesus stopped, it says, and said, who touched me? So now you've got Jairus. His little baby is dying. You've got to know the desperation of a parent when your child is dying. And now this woman stopped the Christ, stopped the answer, stopped momentum, stopped forward action. You've got to see the turmoil that's in his heart. Well, when Jesus is done ministering to the woman with the issue of blood, all of a sudden one of Jairus' servants comes and says, man, don't bother Jesus, man. Don't bother Jesus. Your, your baby died. Your baby died. And what did Jesus do? Listen now, don't be afraid. Only believe. Only believe what? What was Jairus' statement? 
Jesus, if you lay hands on my daughter, I know she'll be well. So even though there was time, he's on his way, distraction, the woman with the issue of blood, mm -hmm. then the bad news, she's dead, Jesus still said, don't give up. Don't step away from your faith declaration. Don't stop believing. Only believe. And so Jairus believed. Jesus got to the house. That's what Lucy just said. All of a sudden, there's these paid wailers. Back in those days, they would pay the people to mourn. They would give you money to go in and cry over your child. So went in, kicked out everybody, and only, listen now, didn't even bring in all 12 of his disciples. Only brought in Peter, James, and John. Even your closest friends don't always belong where you need to be to have faith. And it's there that Jairus' prayer came to fruition. There was a big, big, a lot of stuff happened between it. So a lot of times we're believing God for a miracle. We're believing God for our healing, for our bodies. Believing God that we need God to touch a sickness, touch a disease, touch our spouse, touch our friend, touch our kid. You know, do a miracle with uh, the house. Do a miracle with the car. Do a miracle with finances. Do a miracle. And so we declare it. We stand on it. We, we proclaim it. And then all of a sudden, time keeps on ticking. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Whoa, now listen now. If you already received it, then why are you asking where it is? So it shows you didn't actually receive it when it was prayed for. You keep praying for it. Um, if I, if I, if I, uh, if Pastor Lucy promises me uh, $5. And she said, when we get home. I'm going to give you $5. Fair? Hey, um, uh, can I have the five? Um, you know, you said $5, right? You said five? You said five? I already said I'd give it to you. Listen, do, I mean, can I, can I see it now? Can I, can I see it? No, I said when I get home. No, but I want to see it now. Can I, I just see it I'll, now? You know what? I'll give it to you when I but get I mean, home. But I mean, I know that you said it, but I mean, I'm not really sure. I mean. Obviously, you're not trusting me. You don't have Listen, I just want to see it. Just show it to me. Then I'll believe that you're going to give it to me at the house. If I said I'm going to give it to you, I'm going to give it to you. Isn't that how we treat God? Like a four-year-old. We look like four-year-olds. Wow. If she said it. Believe it. I don't have it. I'm not getting it until we get home. But is it mine? Why? Because she said it. Now, with that, I could have changed my mind because I'm so annoyed. I could have said what a lot of us parents say to our four-year-olds. You know what? Forget it. You don't deserve it. You, 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 don't, you don't trust me. You don't have faith in me. You're nagging. You're annoying me. So you know what? No, I changed my mind. And we think that when we don't get that healing immediately, that God is punishing us. He changed his mind. We annoyed him. And we just have to believe and let it go just trust God. Let go and let God, right? We've heard that expression so many times. And that is the hardest thing to do, isn't it? Sometimes the hardest thing to do. But that's why you got you to keep building your faith. So the Bible says in Romans chapter 4, verse 20 and 21, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able to perform. That's the Bible. That's God. That's your, that's your father. One day, uh, we used to live in a split-level house. And one day, uh, my boys were four and five years old. Cody and Chad were four and five years old. I was going, I know I've given the story before, but it works. I was going over to the covered bridge in Newfield. And so the boys came to the top and says, can, can you get us a lollipop with gum inside? And I said, yes. So I went to the store, I got the milk, got whatever we needed, and I found the two lollipops, and I came home, and when I walked in the door, there are the two boys like this. They didn't say, did you get us a lollipop? No, nope, their hand was out. Why? They knew if I said I was getting them lollipops with gum inside, that I would get them lollipops with gum inside. I was not only willing... I was able, 
and would deliver. But there was a time between their asking and their receiving in the natural. But to them, and the proof's in the pudding, when you walk in the door, their hands are already out. They already knew it was theirs. And expectation is the breeding ground of miracles. So you've got to believe. Next week, we're going to end this. And we're going to end it with how to keep your healing. And then the number one doctrine that the Baptists use to teach that it's not always God's will to heal. Next week is communion service on Thursday. The week after that. Okay? So there is one main belief system with cessationalists as, I didn't say sensationalists, it's called cessational, cessationists. They are people that believe that the power of God ceased at the first century church. And uh, the, mainly the Baptists and the Presbyterians, uh, I'm not speaking against them, but this is their actual belief system. They teach their people that it's not always God's will to heal. And I'm going to show you in the scripture the verse they use and show you why it is not valid. Is that fair? Does anybody have any questions? We have a question over here. Do we have a runner? We have a microphone. Here be your runner. Thank you. Thank you, young man. So um, you said you can kind of lose your healing if you let your mind kind of like run and um, just kind of like, than, yeah, but like let your mouth speak um, like that, that you're not healed or like you're sick, you're still sick, blah, blah, blah. So in, in addition to like rebuking what you've said, do you have to go and get... Um, hands nope. laid on again. You just need to take authority and say, I cancel the words that have come out of my mouth. I will, I will stand firm on the confession of faith that if God said he'll do it, I've already received it and I'm not going to vacillate. Doubt always comes. There's nothing wrong with letting a bird fly around your head, but you should not allow it to nest in your hair. So doubt will come, but whether you let it nest in your hair and ponder it, and then speak it, is different. So doubt will come. That's not happening. Oh, yeah, you see what the doctor said is true. Da-da-da-da-da-da. In the name of Jesus, I bind you. I'm going to keep my mind on Jesus. I'm going to keep my thoughts on Christ. I'm going to believe God's word above my circumstances. And you take authority over that, that process. Okay? Question over there. Speaking of words, if like a fellow Christian person comes up to you, because lately I had some people uh, defriend me off Facebook, and they say stuff or whatever, you're not going to get anywhere basically in a relationship. Wow. Um, I would unfriend them. Well, they blocked. They blocked I've got some blocking off. That's called anyways. blessing, brother. Yes, it is. <laughs> If they say it right in front of you, a Christian brother, because you know how iron sharpens iron. That's not the way you sharpen um, iron. Like, uh, I'm, I'm just saying, are you allowed to say it like a friendly rebuke? Like yeah. say, you just simply say, you know something, I thank you for your opinion, but I don't need your opinion. I'm going to stand on the word okay. of God. Because you, gotta, you can be kind. Okay. You know, some people just don't know. Some people li have lived in doubt and unbelief their whole life. And now you're teaching them to speak faith. They struggle with it. Okay. They struggle with agreeing with God's word, sadly enough, don't you? Just think about that. They struggle with believing God's word. But the fact is, is that you don't have to be mean. There are times to be mean, and I've been mean to people. And I told them, get behind me, devil. You need to shut up because okay. I'm not listening to you anymore. Because I knew where it was coming from. I, and I just followed Jesus' lead. Because okay. Peter said in one, in one chapter, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Hallelujah. And then the next chapter, Jesus said, uh, Peter, uh, Peter said, no one's going to kill you. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You know, so you just, you can't allow people to speak. So you be kind at first. And, and then if they are unwilling to yield to your kindness, 
then you can be blunt. Anybody, listen, I have, I have, you got to know, I get phone calls at one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the, drunks call their pastor. <laughs> and they never call, drunks never call with faith. No, no, you no, no confession, no. <laughs> because what I usually do if, if somebody comes up to me and says something to me, saying negative sometimes, I'll, I'll say, uh, this way I was taught. You don't need um, to say that. You just simply say, I've chosen to believe okay. God's word. Thank you for your opinion, but please don't okay. give it anymore. Because I, I, I usually say, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Yeah, like you can say that negative. when you walk away. Honestly, when the doctors told me Ron is going to die in six months, we thanked the doctor because he's a nice guy. He's doing his best. Thank the doctor. Then we stepped outside the room and said, we'd bind every foul word that's spoken over your life in the name of Jesus. And we speak the word of God over you. So we stood strong on the word. Okay. Right in front of you. Uh, my question is, if you pray for a non-believer, do they keep their healing or miracle? Some of them can. What will happen is, if you remember, Jesus said, go and sin no more, lest the greater thing come upon you. So God will do a miracle with a sinner. But if a sinner does not repent, uh, the many times a sickness that's even greater will come upon them. So what if you don't get a chance to lead them to Christ and just find them to pray for them and they go away healed? Do they keep their healing? Uh, I would really try to lead them to Christ for the, because remember, miracles and signs and wonders are a signpost. It's a pointing to Christ. So you want to take the time to share Christ with them. Um, I don't have an answer for that because I don't know. You know, some God might have somebody outside waiting for them to lead them to the Lord. We just don't know. But if they don't get saved, I can only tell you what Jesus said to that one guy. Go and sin no more, lest a great, greater thing comes upon you. Oh, my last question. Does Satan perform miracles too? Yes, absolutely. Oh, okay. That's what Reiki is, is, uh, is a satanic movement of spiritual energy. Yes. Why are we higher than the angels? Uh, because you've been created as, in the image of God. Angels were created as servants. But the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and God, uh, and God said, let us create man in our image and in our likeness. And then he gave them dominion over the earth and over the sea and over the planet. So we have been made uh, greater than the angels. Uh, Queenie. About six years ago, I started having a lot of pain in my body. And I felt exhausted all the time. So I went to the doctor and they confirmed that it was arthritis. And so um, she proceeded to say to me, you need to go see a specialist because you're going to need it. And I said, no, thank you. I'm going to be prayed for and I'm believing for a healing. Amen. So I left. I came to church that morning. You prayed over me and you released the anointing and... Uh, as long as I was in church on every Sunday that I came into church, there was no pain. Amen. As soon as I walked out, the pain would hit again. And so this went on for a year and a half. You called me or you sent a, a link to me and you said you, you need to start listening to F.F. F. Bosworth. Yep. So when I couldn't hardly get out of bed, I would lay there and listen to him and listen to him. This went on for a year and a half. One morning, I got out of bed. And I suddenly realized, wow, I got up really quick. I went out to the kitchen. I grabbed a bottle of water. I usually couldn't take the cap off. I whipped that off, and I drank the water. And I was saying, oh, my gosh, I'm healed. Amen. And he ha Satan has tried a few times yep. to come against me, which I can tell the symptoms. Yep. And I put him under my feet every time. That's right. And I can tell you right now, I have no problems with arthritis. It's never coming back in my Amen. body again. Amen. Great. Says, I'm, I'm, I'm actually uh, just going to do one more, and no disrespect to everybody else, but it's already 816. So right over here, your hand was up. And then that'll be the last question. Not that I, uh, not that I don't want to answer questions, but I know we have children over, uh, and I always go longer. Okay, so you were um, talking about healing and um, keeping your healing when people speak over you by rejecting it and canceling it and not accepting it. Does the same concept work, for instance, if you pray for somebody, if you are believing, like, and praying? 
that somebody is going to be saved, that they're going to have miracles in their lives. You got to remember when you're praying for somebody else, the person's will always has a play. So when you're praying for things, for stuff, they, stuff don't have a will. But when you're praying for a human, so um, I, I one time had a man come up to me, he goes, I, I need my marriage restored. And I said, well, does your wife want your marriage restored? And he says, no, she's moved in with her boyfriend and, um, you know, they love each other. And, but I'm believing God that she's going to be restored. And I said, well, you know something, every time you pray, God hears you. But it doesn't mean she's going to yield to God's will. And it's the same when it comes to healing. If a person doesn't want to be healed or a person doesn't want to be saved, then you don't have that capacity. Right. But I guess, I guess my question was actually um, if a third person was speaking against your prayers, can you cancel that? Like if you're praying for somebody about something. I think there something. would have to be more details in the question. You might not want to do that. So um, maybe message me. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because some of, I, I'd, I'd have to have more details to understand. But know your authority in Christ. You, can't, you have to talk into the microphone. I'm sorry. But know your, thank you. But know your authority in Christ. The Bible says whatever you bound on earth is bound in the heavens. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in the heavens. So you have the authority through the power of your words and your confession to bind every demonic thing that would come against me or that person that I'm praying for. You have that. You know, so again, recognize your authority in Christ. Recognize that. Walk in it. Step into it. Believe. And watch God do what he does as he establishes his word. I really believe that. Awesome. Okay, let's all stand. Has a good night, eh?